Hello and welcome to CS420. In this course, we'll be learning about everything to do with game hacking. Developing god mode, flying hacks, editing save files, seeing through walls, and all of that fun goodness. This course is going to go in depth on both theory and practice. So not only are we going to be learning how zeros and ones somehow make up a fully functioning game, we'll also be writing hacks together starting on day one. At the end of this course, I'll cover some advanced topics on the bleeding edge of game hacking, things like anti-cheat systems and the inner workings of the tools we're going to use. And I'll talk about open problems in game hacking. One day, when you become a seasoned hacker, you may be one of the people to solve these problems. So let's jump into the prerequisites. There are none. Experienced hackers will give you really, really bad advice. They'll tell you you need to learn C, C++, C Sharp, maybe a bit of Python, and to go read a bunch of books. None of these things are necessary. I didn't know any programming when I started, I just picked it up as I went along. And that's completely fine. The number one predictor for success in learning game hacking is just determination. The biggest myth about hacking is that you need to be some sort of super genius. You'll learn this stuff is not as complicated as people make it out to be. Experienced hackers perpetuate this myth to make themselves look smart. They want to impress you so they make it sound complex. Well, my goal for these videos is to impress you with simplicity. Shameless plug, some optional learning material. If you've ever taken a college course, professors try to sell you their books. Well, instead of trying to sell you a book, I've got a video game. Squally is a game that I'm currently developing that teaches many of the subjects in these lectures. Nobody is forcing you to buy it. However, I do believe it's a very useful resource. I quit my job, turned down multiple interviews at Google so that I could work on this game full time. If you're watching this in 2019, the game is still in early access and the content is somewhat limited. But if you're watching this in the future, then congratulations, the game is probably done and you should check it out. There's a link to this game in the description and I'll cover it a bit more later. Many of the examples in these lectures will come from this game because I own the rights to it, so there's no risk of YouTube taking down my content. Now I'm going to go over all of the skills that we're going to learn. If I say something and it doesn't make sense to you, don't worry. There will be specific lectures on each of these topics and I'll be able to go more in depth in those videos. Memory editing is the most important skill in game hacking. It's used for almost everything you can imagine. God mode, money, teleportation. This is where most of our attention will be focused. The next skill is assembly editing. This is a more advanced version of memory editing, and this is where the really polished hacks get made. It's a lot harder to pull off because it involves programming. You need to learn how to read and write assembly language, but the payoff is far greater than just memory editing. The difference is subtle but important, so let's take an example. Let's say you have 100 maximum health in a video game. With memory editing, if you want god mode, you basically have to keep filling your health to 100. If it goes down, fill it up. And you can do this on a timer every couple of milliseconds, and this is called freezing. The problem with this is that your health isn't really frozen at 100. It just appears that way because the timer is so fast. The problem with this is that if you take 101 damage before the timer fills you back up, you can still die. So it's not a true god mode, and that's the main problem with memory editing. With assembly editing, the approach is different. Instead of repeatedly filling up the player's health, we make it impossible to lose health in the first place. This means we can disable the code responsible for damaging the player, and we no longer have the timer problem. Hex editing is a term that generally refers to editing save files or other simple files. Hex editing is rarely used these days because memory editing tends to be far more superior in almost every case. However, it's still a useful skill to have in your tool belt. If you're into console game hacking, usually memory editing is not an option and you have to resort to hex editing. There's also a few skills that build on hex editing, which are useful for hacking online games, such as packet editing. Packet editing is like hex editing, but instead of editing a save file, you edit packets. Packets are information sent to a video game server. The idea is that you lie to the servers about what you've done. For example, if you want to buy an item for 200 gold, you might send a packet to the server saying which item you want to buy and the number 200. The server says, okay, great. I'll subtract 200 gold from your inventory and I'll give you the item. Now in packet editing, you change that 200 to another number, say negative 200. And this tricks the server into giving you money instead of taking it. 
Now in practice, it's never quite this simple due to something called server-side checks, but we'll get more into that later. Okay, the last major subject is botting. Botting is when you write computer programs that play the game for you. This is where the money gets made and this is where the lawsuits happen. Botting is really the pinnacle of game hacking because it combines all of the previous mentioned skills. Of course, when it comes to online games, you have to be very cautious. Mike Donnelly famously developed a program called Glider that automatically played World of Warcraft and helped users get rich in the game. He made about four and a half million dollars from this software and then he got sued by Blizzard for six million dollars. This is one of those situations where it's better to learn from someone else's mistakes than your own. These are some additional topics that may get covered. These can be very useful in specific situations or just to help broaden your understanding, but generally aren't applicable to every game. The previous skills apply to any game, but these really apply to very, very niche situations, but they're still good to know. So the skills mentioned earlier are techniques, but in order to use these techniques, you need to understand the underlying computer science. Just to draw an analogy, you can be a blacksmith, but you also want to know metallurgy. If you want to make a sword, you need to know what metal to use. You want that sword to be durable. You want it to be sturdy. You can get pretty far without knowing that stuff if you're an apprentice blacksmith, because you can just ask your, your boss, hey, what, what metal do I use for this sword? And then they'll tell you. The same is true in hacking. You can get pretty far without knowing the computer science, but at some point you need to learn it. Throughout these lectures, I'll be switching back and forth between theory and practice so that you can gain an understanding of both how to perform the hacks and how the hacks actually work. Let's jump into this diagram briefly. As a game hacker, we're far more concerned with the stuff on the left under program anatomy and under numbers. Now, if you get into online game hacking, that's when you'll dabble into the network side of things and you'll have to learn a bit about packets. Uh, we won't go into into cryptography because it just doesn't come up very often in game hacking. Uh, we're very fortunate. Other hackers occasionally do have to deal with this stuff, but not us. And we will cover a little bit in hardware, mostly related to the CPU. By the end of this series, you'll have a deep understanding of how programs are run on a computer and how to make them do what you want them to do. Before we get into specifics, let's go over the universal process for hacking games. This applies to any of the previously mentioned skills. There are two main phases here. Find the thing you want to change, change it, and see if you succeeded. And if you didn't succeed, then you, you learned something. This is essentially a simplified version of the scientific method, which you may have learned in school, and you'll see this pattern arise again and again with all of the hacking methods that we cover. So for example, if you want to hack a save file, first you find the save file, then you find the information in the save file that you want to change. Then you change it, you boot up the game, and you see if it worked. Another example is god mode. Uh, find the code that hurts the player, disable it, and see if you're invincible. Over the course of these lectures, we're going to demystify how computers work. Now, you may have heard someone say, like, oh, computers are just a bunch of zeros and ones. This is the equivalent of saying the human body is just a bunch of atoms. Sure, it's true, but that's not very useful information. I have several friends who are chemical engineers and bioengineers, and they rarely talk about atoms. They talk about molecules. They talk about pH. This doesn't mean atoms aren't useful. That just means they aren't usually the best way to think about the world. Similarly, we'll learn that most hackers don't think in zeros and ones. Sometimes we think in bytes, integers, floats, strings, instructions, structures, memory pages. These are the molecules of a program. These allow us to think about complex ideas without losing our minds. But let's start with this bad understanding. We'll start with the zeros and ones model, and every lecture will build on this and work towards a true and more meaningful understanding about how computers run software. By the end of these lectures, we'll go from the zeros and ones model to something far more profound. We'll understand how these zeros and ones can give rise to a fully formed game with fancy 3D graphics. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or feedback, leave a comment on the video.